will guide you through beautiful Luddy Hall. It's a signature building, which we um, started to uh, do our work in about four years ago. And then the pandemic stroke. And so for one and a half years, there was almost nothing going on in this uh, wonderful building. But we are all back since uh, June this year. Uh, initially, uh, partially, now fully, all with masks all the time. So officially, we have to use those masks. Uh, and ultimately, however, there is 100% capacity back on campus, which is wonderful to, uh, to have the team back here. Um, so um, this way, um, Bruce can guide you through Luddy Hall. You will get to see some of the maps which are hanging on the walls here. There's also a, a set of larger format uh, maps in our CNS area. And I think the plan is um, to have more Q&A on um, how to make these maps, what kind of data sets can be used, how are these data sets analyzed. Oftentimes, it's not just taking raw data and visualizing it, but oftentimes it takes quite a few steps, um, maybe 12, 15, to get from the uh, raw data to a cleaner and ever cleaner, more interlinked, more uh, useful data that then can be visualized. In many cases, you want to run, for instance, burst analysis to look for sudden increases in the usage frequency of terms. Uh, if you, for instance, look at Wikipedia data and how Wikipedia uh, pages are edited over time, uh, you might also do a lot of network analysis. Some of the works that you saw here on the screen just recently, they actually start out as a big um, uh, spaghetti ball, is it also called? So it's it's a very dense network. And then you might like to apply clustering and uh, backbone identification to uh, get the true structure of that network to show. Um, ultimately, then you're uh, also applying size coding and color coding and shape coding to uh, encode additional data variables. And um, here, um, you oftentimes also want to provide different views of the very da same data set. So you might have one base map, um, then overlay different types of data, just like YY had the pulse of a nation where he uh, showed happiness and as it unfolds over the daytime. Um, I'm hearing myself double now. I think they're getting closer. <laughs> um, so. For those kind of purposes, you then have to decide what is relevant for a specific uh, stakeholder group. Oftentimes, we try to create maps for experts, um, and they uh, might have time to actually learn um, how this uh, data is encoded. But in more and more cases, we are also designing these data visualizations for a more general audience. So here, uh, it's actually good to build on what they already know. Um, Google has taught the world how to uh, read maps. So many people can read uh, map-like uh, visualizations. So we now started to map science uh, in a format that looks very much like a cartographic map. And you go from one continent or region of science to another region of science, and you overlay your own career trajectory or your own schedule of classes over that um, set of um, different regions. You might also overlay how much you like or dislike a certain science uh, that might be then encoded as a heat map. Uh, but you can also uh, start mapping other data sets because not everybody cares about scholarly publications. You might uh, create a map of uh, jobs. And in fact, we have a project going on where we have access to a very large um, data set of uh, open job advertisements. And um, using those job advertisements, you can see what kind of jobs are currently open and where they are geospatially, how much they might pay, um, what kind of skills are required for um, uh, getting one of those jobs. And then you might like to find your favorite jobs on that map and uh, get to understand uh, what kind of skills you might miss in order to get your dream job. And then you can bring in educational materials um, to see, for instance, what courses are taught here in beautiful Luddy Hall or what courses are online, potentially free or for pay. So you can really try to optimize your career pathways. And one part that's really important right now is uh, that because of the pandemic, there is uh, an increase in the use of AI and robotics and automation because um, that's uh, something that um, industry can very, very quickly scale up in, and uh, it is not impacted so much by the pandemic. It doesn't get sick from COVID. 
And so very, very quickly, uh, more and more jobs are not relevant for human labor anymore, but they can be automatized. And so people which currently hold these jobs, um, they should uh, recognize that and they might like to train to um, have skills that are uh, relevant for all these open jobs that cannot get filled. And to be honest, some of these jobs are the more interesting jobs, the more lucrative jobs, the jobs that are more future-proof. So ultimately, our team is trying to uh, uh, help uh, many understand that this is happening, um, exactly what jobs might not exist anymore in five years and 10 years, uh, but also how people can come from where they are right now to other areas which they might like to um, do as a job. So, um, for instance, many people have great hobbies that they really enjoy doing. So why not take those skills and um, use them to um, get to a kind of area in the landscape of jobs, which is more future-proof and less risky um, to be automatized. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna, um, when I jump here over, we are actually tethered to each other here. <laughs> All right, you ready? Let's go. So we're gonna um, go through Buddy Hall. We're on the fourth floor of Buddy Hall. And I'm just gonna show you a few of the visualizations that I've done for the Places and Spaces Mapping Science exhibit. Um, so uh, if you get, if anyone who happens to come to Buddy Hall, you'll see by the elevators. Um, there are usually two maps per floor, so you can always. Some, like this is the one I'll be talking about, but I was going to show you the, the source of material that the background is Wikipedia. I have another visualization um, in the other room that will make that clear when we talk about this. So let's go over here to the fourth to uh, visit the CNS suite, <laughs> basically, in Lenny Hall. All right, yes. Right. Okay. An emergent mosaic of Wikipedian activity. So this is um, a visualization of all of Wikipedia circa 2007. There are 659,000 Wikipedia articles, um, 16 million links. We uh, drew, so each is these teeny tiny circles and they're size coded um, according to your edit activity. So uh, if they've been edited frequently and recently, then uh, they, they become bigger and redder. So it's duly encoded as far as the color and the size. And then, um, so two articles are drawn close to each other if they um, have been cited by a third article. So it's co-citation. Um, so then what you get, what ends up happening is we then feed this into a force-directed layout algorithm that um, draws two nodes close to each other if they're similar. So you end up getting these clusters of, of um, articles. And um, so the, 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 the other piece here is we, did, we labeled, we cut this up into a grid and we labeled, uh, we took the, the, the most popular article in that grid and gave it, took, found the image and used that as a label of that area. So because they're generally clustered by some sort of topic, um, we thought that would be a good way of just sort of labeling an area. And then you can just find something, find an image, and then look, it's fun to just find an image and then look at all the stuff around to see, to kind of get an idea of what, what you're looking at. And so originally this was a five foot by five foot um, visualization printed visualization that was was intended to be um, and so what you have in the top left is a grouping of um, uh, popular science or popular culture pop culture and of course it's hard to see on this part and then there's uh, social geographic stuff here and then through the middle is math science technology and some other things um, so th this this sort of visualization was designed so that you know someone could just walk up to it and just start exploring and be like, 
okay, why is Jesus dying at the end of here? And why is Adolf Hitler a gigantic over here? Um, and uh, you also get a sense of the time period. This is just as Hurricane Katrina. So again, this um, this the way that we're encoding these nodes sort of gives you the pulse of Wikipedia at the time. So anytime something happens, people on Wikipedia end up editing articles, bring them up to date, bring in new information. And so this can sort of capture some of the things that are going on at the time. Um, you can't see it on here, but over here is the, it says Nintendo Revolution, um, and that was the Nintendo Wii, which was coming out around the same time. And uh, so this this is um, this is one of my favorite visualizations that I I I always want to come back to this. Um, so in, in modern times nowadays, you know, with uh, visualization over the web is what generally people do, and people. Uh, can, are used to being able to use these zooming interfaces, map-like interfaces. So someday I want to do this again. And the number of articles now are closing, closing close to four million. I'm not sure exactly how many articles there are now, but um, I'd like to do this, a similar technique. But as you zoom in, you get more and more context-related um, uh, images. So that when you're zoomed in, you get more and more relevant images. Um, and the, the, the technology has gotten really good. Um, um, the layout algorithms are still, it's still difficult to lay out a whole bunch of articles no matter what you do. Um, so I'm also working on um, this thing called tripods, with the, which has a multi-level graph display technology. Sort of will try to help that. And essentially what you have to do is you have to aggregate up in some way. Um, and and doing figuring out those aggregations is the, the hard part. So uh, so this is one of my favorite visualizations I've I've done. Did that back in two thousand seven. Um, so then I I can go back over to the so this is the science related Wikipedia. So now we took that base map and then oh and then highlighted the math, science, and technology um, articles. And they're color coded according to um, the, the category of the article. So then you can see this this clustering approach. Then you see math, science, and technology are going through the center here. And then we have different um, size codings of the the uh, those articles to sort of so there's verse verse activity. This is article edit activity. That's the thing I was talking about on the big map um, that says evolution right there. So one of the things that you see on this map is some of the bigger articles are not necessarily recent, but they are um, articles that are disputed <laughs> uh, in one way or another. And so there, there's a lot of that. Um, so that's this. Well, Can you say something about the size coding again? Yes. So the size coding, um, oh yeah, it's, 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 it's encoded by the likelihood of it being that type of article. Um, I don't remember exactly how we determine that, but so the bigger ones are more, are more likely to be that. And oh, they, they are actually labeled. Um, this again, this is again, was designed to be printed, so it, you, we want people that would go in and look real close at the labels and try and, you know, sort of figure out what's going on, find interesting things in there. The virtual office tour. <laughs> yeah. Looks like in a video game right now. Does it? Yeah, kind of like a third person. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is uh, another visualization I did around that time called Movies and Actors. So we took all of the internet movie database. Um, and so this, this has got like there are three layers to this visualization. And if I were doing it today, I might do it differently. Um, but 
So at the very bottom, you see a, a long, essentially a long listing from 1890 to 2007 of all the movies ever, ever created up to that time period as, as, as captured in the Internet Movie Database. And they're color coded by um, their genre. Um, so there's short, drama, comedy, documentary, adult, romance, and thriller. Um, and then other is this gray color. So you can look at each year and you can sort of like see a proportion of um, how many different kinds of movies are color coded. This again was designed to be printed so that you could. Um, you sort of look at, you, it's hard to see the smaller ones. You can usually look at the beginning of a year and, and see the, see, read the, read the, the titles a little bit. Um, and then, so then the next thing is we have a, uh, an actor network, which is overlaid on top. Um, that's what these dots are. Each dot is an actor and they are um, color coded according to the uh, genre of movie that they acted in the most. Um, so, and then two um, actors are drawn close to each other if they've acted in a lot of movies together. So you get these troops of people who work together quite a bit. Um, it's a really famous one, this movie. The, the as far as a movie, oh, yeah. um, so uh, the the other the, there's that the third the third layer are these lines, and these lines draw from the movie, and these these movies are winners of um, the Academy Award for Best Picture for those years. So you can see, you know, two thousand two, two thousand three, two thousand. So they. Um, so they draw from the movie space into the actor space. So you can kind of see where they're pulling from the, uh, the actor space. As it were. Um, and you can look at clusters. Like one thing you can do is you can look at for comedy and romance. So like you can find blue and orange clusters they, they, in romant, romantic comedies. I think I don't know these guys. They're, and of course, the, the the most the funniest one, of course, is uh, the these red clusters. These red clusters are adult movies. Uh, so Peter North uh, uh, starred in um, one thousand five hundred ninety adult <laughs> movies at the time, um, and so they're this this red splotch in the visualization. Um, so this has just been, and um, for both of these, for all three of those that I've shown you, that if you look on, if you search Gigapan, and for my name, Bruce Herr, or if you look for an emergent mosaic of Wikipedian activity, you can find the gigapan so you can zoom in and out and you can get a, it, it's got pretty high, high quality uh, data so you can actually see what, see those more. Or you can always, you know, these exist, this science, the science, SciMaps activity, SciMaps exhibit um, also goes around. So, and you go to SciMaps.org to get more information. So I was thinking maybe we can show them the, uh, Amatria next, so, or do you have that and schedule to do something? I don't kind of think stuff? so. Okay. That'll be a good one. So then I think I'll probably say that and then um, we can sit down to see if we have any questions or comments. So this is again, Luddy, beautiful Luddy Hall, fourth floor. Uh, I'm gonna show you the Amatria. The Maybe you should describe that. <laughs> sure, we can switch in a second. Yeah, because uh, this is uh, 
really cool sculpt three sculpture here. All right, we're gonna switch real quick. Well, hello everybody. I'm Andy. Um, I'm a research scientist here in the lab. I finished my PhD here a couple of months ago. Um, I'm going to do a somewhat impromptu tour of Amatria now. I hope that you can see the sculpture just all right because we got a lot of backlight here. But I hope that it's going to be okay and fine. Also, I think it's Bruce's first time being uh, a, uh, a director of photography. So, all right, <laughs> well, first today. All right, so Amatria is an interactive sculpture. Unfortunately, she's currently being uh, under maintenance. Um, but if you look at her, you're going to see that it's, it's a pretty big sculpture. Um, it is also public, you can access it anytime. But it is basically the first thing that you notice when you enter to the fourth floor of Bloody Hall. Maybe let's go over there onto the stairs real quick just to see what it feels like walking up <laughs> the stairs. So, Bruce, if you want to just go down there. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, and then we can get a really nice shot. It's fun working with that gimbal, right? Yeah, it's a little less air prone for. All right, so now we are standing under Amatria and it gives you this really, really beautiful, like overhead view, especially when you just come up here. It kind of always looks like a smiling face. <laughs> I see you and now it smiles at you. All right, so Amatria is, I always like to describe her with kind of two metaphors. Metaphor number one is the metaphor of a landscape. You can look at Amatria as an architectural piece and you can see a landscape reflected in it. Uh, if you want to come back up with me again, it's got to become a lot more clear when we look at it from the side. So we come up the stairs here and now we're going to walk to the outside of Amatria. All right, so if you look over Amatria from the side, it always reminds me of two rising suns. Looks like we have two rising suns, mm. and then this looks like a little bit like a, like a hill. And it's especially apparent when you look at the architectural drawings, which you can maybe look at later. Um, so this really, really nicely showcases that you can see it, something like, that there's something very organic and natural about the overall structure of Amatria. Not even looking at individual parts, just looking at the overall structure. Um, and then the second way that we look, can look at Amatria, I think, is the metaphor of a network. If you took out all of the electronics and laid them out flat without any of the structure, you would get a really fascinating um, array of little microelectronics that are all connected to each other. And kind of funnily, they all end up in a control laptop that is over there in the closet. <laughs> so you get this really intricate network that has hundreds if not thousands of individual pieces, you've got like lights, you've got vibration motors, um, you've got speakers, et cetera, et cetera, microphones. All right, so we talked about that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the details of Amatria, if you want to come closer to me. So up here, this is the so-called grotto. The grotto is, is, is basically the central part of Amatria where you have all of these glass vessels. We also have these arrays here. These are called sound sensor scouts. They consist of three infrared sensors, it look like robot eyes. We have a microphone here, then we have a microphone up there, and then we have a speaker that's cut with a custom printed shell, and it's surrounded by six lights, they're called rebel stars, and also six moths, which are vibration motors. So this array here, like a sound sensor scout, we have that six times across the entire sculpture. So we have six sound sensor scouts. And then I don't know if you can see it, but on top of that, you have one of these racks that has a whole bunch of uh, microelectronics in it as well. Amatria is really fun to be immersed in. When we built Amatria, we, it took us about three weeks, and so there was a scaffold here. So you could essentially just spend like, all the time just, like, climbing around inside the sculpture. All right, let's talk about the parts, the overall parts of the sculpture. So right on top of us, uh, is the so-called sargasso veil. And the sargasso veil is the only part of the sculpture that does not have any electronics. This is a whole bunch of uh, acrylic and mylar, and then some um, some vests, some vials with fluid inside. Um, and it always kind of reminds me of being under a snowy sky. Okay, so it kind of greets you as you come into the sculpture. Now on the other side, there's another part of the sargasso veil, and that kind of just uh, 
provides kind of like a cover for the sculpture. All right, then as we come under the sculpture, we have the so-called canopy or the spar field. The canopy or the spar field is where most of the electronics are. So first and foremost, we have the sound. We, all the sounds in the scouts are in the in the other canopy. It's kind of like it evokes an idea of like a dense rainforest canopy. So as you walk here, you can see we have all of this growth over us, and all of these, these vinegar batteries, all of this is just right on top of us. And there's something very organic to the structure. And now if you want to come with me over here, we're gonna look at the two other parts. So we have the big sphere over here. And then we have the small sphere over here. Um, and the spheres, I'm not an architect, but I was told is that the spheres are really a structural achievement because they only need two points of suspension, which mm. I, I was told is the present. I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> I don't want to go over here. So um, this is the sphere seen from behind. You can see that. Can I actually come a little closer? Uh, this is the material from, from what with Matria is mostly made. This is acrylic. And so these come out of the laser cutter completely flat. And then they are being literally put into a pizza oven for three minutes and then extruded along the Y axis, so along up. And then you end up with all of these spars. And I don't know how many hundreds of those there are in the sculpture. But I do know that somebody in Toronto made them because there was a. There, we received a truckload of them when we started building. So somebody in, a, in Toronto did all this, <laughs> and I feel bad. I, I, I did this myself before this extruding, and even if it's automatized, it takes a lot of time. And then occasionally you have these metal ones here just for structural integrity, I assume. Another really nice thing that you can see here in the back is you have all of these racks again. You know, of course, they're somewhat hidden here. The idea is to kind of hide them here, um, but it just, um, there's something be really beautiful about seeing these racks and then all of these cables that run in between the uh, in between the components. And then, of course, as you get towards the inside of the sphere, you have an extreme density of electronics. You have all of these uh, speakers. You have uh, uh, vibration motors in there and lights, and it's just it's just really beautiful. All right, next up, we're gonna go back under the grotto. And then we're gonna go over here. You guys should see this. This is fourth floor. Really beautiful. Yes. Laddie Hall is a very nice building, evidenced by the fact that we always have people from other schools come here and uh, take over the study. <laughs> All right. So if you want to step down here, and I hope that you can see this. Uh, so one challenge that Amatria that we have with Amatria is there are so many electronics in here and electronics typically need cabling. Okay? So there has to be a way to hide the cabling. Okay? Um, and the designers did this in a really neat way. Mostly the cables are just kind of, just kind of blend in with the spar field up here, for example. They just kind of blend in, they're hard to see. In some cases, uh, they are, <laughs> they blend in even better. If you come over here, there is a huge bundle of cables going up from on top of the spar field to the top of the ceiling. And it's probably, you can probably can't, can't even see it. Oh, now. oh, I see it now. It took yes. me a second to see it. Yes. yes. So this is That's what they call the umbilical cord. Yeah, the umbilical cord is just a huge bundle of cables that run <laughs> from the spark field up into the ceiling and then to the left into a huge power box that's also completely yeah. hidden that took like five people to lift. And then it runs from there into a closet. So hiding the cables and kind of hiding the, it's kind of like hiding the puppet string. Oh, that's cool. It's another huge challenge when you have when you build a sculpture. And obviously everything is cable. There's um, only, only very few only very few elements in this sculpture are wireless um, for a variety of reasons. All right, so cool. maybe one more thing I can show if we go over here to the kiosk. So as part of my like creative project slash research work when we built Amatria was to make this 3D visualization. So this is a this is a 3D model of Amatria. Um, so you can see here we have a touch screen that allows us to control the camera. So we are currently here. Down here is the staircase. Okay, that we just went up and down. Now we are standing here. Uh, and so, yeah, this was developed by Leonard Cross 
a former colleague of ours and then a buddy um, and then myself. So we got the. Um, <laughs> oh. yeah. All right, so um, what we can see here is we have a simplified version of the model. Okay, so um, it is not the full resolution. You can see it's just a whole bunch of like simplified polygons. So, for example, for the for all of these spars, rather than having the full spar model, it would have been like hundreds of polygons. We just have what is that like seven polygons, uh, or seven triangles, like extremely simple. Okay, and so this allows us to actually deploy this app uh, on a on, on a Windows device here. Um, another thing you can see here is we have this colorful overlay of all the electronics. So we have the sound sensor scouts here, six of them. So we have the infrared sensors here, and then we have the microphones and speakers and mics. So for example, if we turn off everything except for the uh, infrared sensors, we see that the infrared sensors are only really available where people are walking, which makes sense. It would make no sense having an infrared sensor up there where nobody would ever walk. The same goes for microphones. Okay. So these are really there to detect human presence. Now, if we look at the speaker, we can see that this is extremely spatial sound. You got three speakers in the big sphere, one speaker in the small sphere, and then six speakers in the canopy. And then if we look at lights, we see that the sculpture is full of lights. Especially nice here when it's darker, like at night. And, and it also creates this effect where the sculpture looks different depending on the time of the day, because then the lights are more or less strong. And then finally, you can see the vibration motors are everywhere. Mm -hmm. The whole sculpture is full of vibration motors. So that's really like the, the most prominent sensation when you are under the sculpture is you hear the rustling of the leaves just because they're shaking in a really nice way. Right, so this visualization is a, simply a static overview of the electronics in the sculpture. It is 3D, but it is with the touch screen. We have a little um, annotation up here how we actually control it. You can also reset the camera here. Uh, this little, little info panel that tells you a little bit about Tavola. Yeah, we call it Tavola, it's the Italian word for table. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, here we go. We had a, had a lot of fun, a lot of fun developing this little app, and I think it turned out really nice. And it's been here for about two and a half years now. Still, still working. Still working. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, maybe we could go over to the list lab real quick. We have some, um, some parts of our material there that we could maybe just showcase. Sure. Um, and then I don't know what time it is, but we'll find that out in a second. 2.37. Okay. And then I threw, I'm sure we can also take some questions maybe. All I've right. seen some chats through there, but. Here we go. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna talk about, we just did my material tour. We're gonna talk about the, you know what, maybe you can just wait here real quick. It's pretty dark back there. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Let's go outside so we can make it look. Actually, we can just go there on the stage. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go <laughs> get the, the plans for Amatria Okay. And we're doing in lunch order. Okay. So, um, Ellie, please order in February. <laughs> what are we? Um, uh, my favorite. Maybe I'll look at the menu, but something spicy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Okay. I guess you can use the yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Kadi, can you check with me that you can see this all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I mentioned earlier that one metaphor for explaining Amatria is the metaphor for network. So again, if you strip all of the electronics out, you get end up with these schematics. And the nice thing about these schematics is they could they are already like a work of art. I mean, the level of detail is intense. And it also shows you all of the cabling that is required to make the sculpture work. So uh, in terms of a network, we have a whole lot of like leaves, so like childless nodes. 
So basically where the network ends, you can see all of these vibration models, for example. You can see speakers, um, you can see lights, these little triangles here. Um, and you can see how there is this hierarchy going on and everything eventually ends up in this control laptop over here. Um, this control laptop is in a closet hidden away mm -hmm. from everything. Um, it's a really interesting architecture where we have, uh, we have, where we have one laptop for, um, for webcam just to do remote um, road maintenance. We have a control laptop and we have this 4D sound laptop. Now, the 4D sound laptop generates the sound, mm -hmm. but the 4D sound laptop also generates random behavior uh, that is then streamed to the control laptop using the open sound protocol um, or open sound control protocol. And then the, um, the control laptop running a Python script sends out the uh, appropriate commands to uh, 13 Raspberry Pis across the sculpture. And these Raspberry Pis in turn are connected with Arduino, um, Arduino boards that then in turn, oh, okay, that, that then in turn um, execute all of these, um, execute all of the commands. And yeah, um, it is just really cool about Amatria because you can see it from a whole lot of different angles. You know, if you're a data visualization researcher like I am, it is really cool looking at the real-time data streams, looking at the 3D structure of the sculpture and how the activity relates to the structure. You can look at visitor numbers, visitor fluctuations. Um, or, you know, that was actually one of my favorite things to do with Amatria was just developing vis visual tools for the engineers and architects when they built it. Just, you know, developing these tools for them that would be useful in the field, just super applied. Um, so there's a lot of angles. And if you're an engineer, I'm sure there's some interesting questions with regards to the electronics and the sculpture, how to optimize the electronics. If you're an architect, there's a lot, I mean, this is a lot of structure that has to be in place, that has to be stable. And um, you also have to have a way to engage the viewer with different perspectives, and it has to look good from all sides. There's a lot of challenge there. If you're a network scientist, I'm pretty sure there are some interesting questions there as well. The idea behind Amatria is it brings people of different backgrounds together. And we can ask questions that we can then try and answer together. All right. Um, okay. Beautiful. Fine. I don't know if you have any questions right now. Otherwise, Bruce, if you want, you can uh, talk about spoke. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. And you can probably just do that with the ball. Yes. And I'm going to put the main camera back on. All right. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us on this tour. Are we on? Hello, 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 hello. Okay, great. Uh, so we, we've seen a lot of static visualizations, um, and uh, you know the other the other piece of the sci maps, the places and spaces exhibit, are these macroscopes that um, we're on the seventh iteration of that. So seven years of uh, macroscopes so far of interactive visualizations. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about the spoke visualizer that we uh, uh, worked on and are working on and the technology behind it, which allows us to take these large scale visualizations and make them available over the web and uh, be able to search and use, uh, use the visualization for um, your work. So the spoke visualizer, um, this, this is a, the small part, this spoke is a, a knowledge graph, a database of databases, and it encodes um, different things about uh, biomedical, biomedicine things. So there's, you see, we have diseases, we have symptoms of that disease. Diseases are uh, associated with certain genes certain pieces of the anatomy. So this, this shows a, what we call a metagraph. And that's how within this large network, the, the different node types, how they interact with each other. And the, the spoke has over 3 million nodes and 25 million edges. Um, and this is a little hard for me to see, so I'm gonna move around. Um, so we have this thing, so you can choose, this is more of a 
proof of concept, but I can't see. <laughs> okay, is that okay? So this is a uh, you can choose a disease, um, say coronary artery disease, and you can search for a food. Um, agave, that's sure. And so then you can see this, the Metagraph updates to show um, the, the meta node. So agave is a food. It connects up to coronary artery disease through the compound, probably sugar. Um, show the details. Then we can switch to this um, multi-level graph visualization system called tripods or map for psi. And uh, what this does is it allows us to have this zoomable, uh, multi-level visualization um, that as you zoom in, you get more and more relevant nodes. Um, but you also, you know, when you're up at the top high level, you get these clusters, these visual clusters that can help you sort of see the structure of the, the visualization, but not, um, but not have to be overwhelmed by a million nodes and a bunch of labels. Um, so this helps you to see the structure. The, the colors are in, uh, don't have anything particularly encoded, just, the, just as a, they're color coded in a way so that you can see the, tell the clusters apart. Um, so then you see coronary artery disease and you see uh, agave. So as you zoom in, um, you see it's connected to folic acid, which is connected over to agave. So this is a pretty simple setup, um, but the visualization system itself is very scalable. Um, we're hoping to scale it up to 10 million nodes. We're still working on that, but we can, I think at this point we can definitely hit a million um, as far as uh, scalability. And uh, yeah, so that's a short little demo of Spoke. Is there anything else? It's a one day other data sets that you could also visualize in a similar way. Um, are there projects which use a similar um, setup um, that um, uh, could be productized? And I think it, it's hard to, uh, to type anything in. <laughs> you might like to try this <laughs> while I have the mic. This is apply where we can apply this right now to uh, biomedicine with Spoke and other data visualizations. Um, we're also connecting it to um, epilepsy data, which I guess is in the same vein, um, but any, so at basically any sort of network graph, like the Wikipedia visualization I showed earlier, could very easily go and uh, be processed by this uh, system. Um, and so as far as like commercialization, this provides you know, um, this high level overview, but that you can still connect to the data and, and drill down in very key details at the bottom. Um, so. Yeah, um, about how many program programmers are working on this and how do you even organize all these programmers to work on so many different projects? Uh, uh, at CNS, data visualization um, goes through the similar sort of software process that you see for most modern production software. We use a thing called Scrum, where we try and go and figure out the user stories, try and figure out what it is the user actually wants. And, and then we try to leverage data visualization in order to uh, get to that. Um, so modern visualization is generally delivered over the web. So um, uh, our team, we work in small teams, um, generally about four, four, to, four to seven different Four to seven people working together, um, splitting splitting the work part and working together to solve problems at the same time. Um, yeah, so hey, um, the thing that sort of surprised you in the in the fire, interesting connections that you were like, oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't realize that, that would be the case. Realize how much, and this maybe is not fully understanding the data set just yet, but how much disease is affected by all these other foods and these 
via these compounds. Um, the um, is this so for the individual you say I just want to be healthier? <laughs> Would it be something that I could I could use for that? Uh, so this was a proof of concept. So, um, and there would be a lot of issues just being like, oh, I searched coronary artery disease in potato. Um, should I eat more potatoes or should I eat less potatoes? <laughs> uh, or does it have anything to do with coronary artery, artery disease at all? Um, so uh, this, this visualization specifically, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in, like I said, as a proof of concept, but we are working closely with the spoke folks to create a visualization system where you can get answers to these bigger questions or or your citizen scientists um but you know i think with all visualization and with all statistics you have to be you have to be a little bit careful whatever you're using so that you can under you know you have to understand how the the, the data was gathered and and analyzed before you can necessarily say, okay, everybody eat more potatoes. <laughs> Programmer and I wanna do more data visualizations and maybe I'm even looking for a job. Is there any opportunity to um, work on that all with you guys together? We need software developers, particularly Angular. Um, we have job openings iu.edu. Um, it's a fun environment. You get to work on cutting edge software and with some cool people. And we work in a really cool building. So that's always an advantage. Um, so yeah. <laughs>